and faculty member at PNCA and executive director of Converge 45. Um, it's really my amazing pleasure to welcome you to PNCA and the Ford Family Foundation's critical conversation with David Ayaya Afonso and his presentation, An Anecdoted Typography of Chance, Collecting as Creation and as Destruction. I want to begin by saying that PNCA and the Ford Family Foundation's activities and their partners are located on the traditional homelands of Indigenous people. Since the arrival of European explorers, the Indigenous people of Oregon have repeatedly been dispossessed of their land by settler colonialism, including the United States government and their policies to forcibly remove the Indigenous populations to reservations in Oregon and around the country. Today, the descendants of Oregon's first people continue to make important contributions uh, to communities, institutions, the state of Oregon, to the United States of America, and to the world. In acknowledgement of the original people of this land we occupied, we expend our respect and to the indigenous people of Oregon and to all of their and to all other displaced indigenous people who call Oregon home. With this event and our collective activities, Critical Conversations recognizes Oregon's first people as the past, present, and future stewards of the land, and that we pledge to commit to make ongoing efforts to center indigenous existence and related knowledge creativity, resilience, and resistance in the work that we do. Uh, the Ford Family Foundation's critical conversations are part of the interwoven work led by the University of Oregon with collaborators PNCA, PSU, and Reed College, uh, which is supported by the Ford Family Foundation's visual arts program. This multi-year program brings professional curators and critics from outside the Pacific Northwest to conduct one-on-one -on -one studio visits with artists, to deliver public lectures, and to join in community conversations. Uh, later this year, the Ford Family Foundation's visual, visual arts program will publish Figuring, a publication pr uh, produced by the Critical Conversations coming out in May 2021, featuring writings by, on, and about Oregon's arts ecology. I'm really excited to get to introduce David. Um, this is a talk and moment long in the making. Um, David was scheduled to come to Portland in April of 2020, uh, but of course we all know how that turned out. Um, and then later it was delayed and then transformed to this virtual, virtual visit. Um, you know, and as, as David is an artist, a curator, a writer, and a researcher, um, and I'll put his full bio into the chat later on so you can read that, as you can also find that on the website. You know, and, and as the foundation was moving toward the new format of this yearly publication, um, the advisory group was talking and we were speaking about how the visitors in the future uh, would be great to uh, also commission to write texts uh, around uh, some of Oregon's arts ecology. And so David came to mind right away uh, as he's authored many articles and books uh, and chapters of books um, within visual studies, art and education, interventionist art practice, uh, institutional critique. And he's also an editor um, and has edited the Journal of Visual Culture for a very long time and then also edits with uh, Cultural Anthropology and M. Rajinsa. Um, and then in 2019, he, with Independent Curators International, launched a touring exhibition um, that he curated titled Never Spoken Again, Rogue Stories of Science and Collections. Uh, and this project really digs into how institutional collections care for and display, you know, colonial conquests, spoils of war, and all too often one-sided histories uh, and the exhibition draws together a set of artistic practice that poke at the objects and the systems of distribution that facilitate uh, the circulation of these so-called histories. And when I really read about the exhibition, it was clear that now was the time to bring David to Oregon to, to engage with our artistic community, who are also often working to draw out new narratives and to displace long-held myths that somehow became facts, or to insert myths to confuse the dominant white supremacist facts. And indeed, it's been over a decade uh, that I've known David, and it's been about that long since we've actually been in the same room together. Um, and yet, you know, we've kept in touch. And you know, this testament to our commitment to each other, uh, to the practice of keeping in touch, uh, and to following the work of one's peers, um, you know, is really what led uh, David and I to be here in this box with you all tonight. And it's really David. David is the type of person that I wish to collaborate with and that I wish to bring into our community of cultural producers, which I'm so happy and proud to be a part of. And I'm really looking forward to hearing David's presentation tonight. And I just wanna thank everybody for joining us 
and the Ford Family Foundation and PNCA for making this happen. And with that, I'll turn it over to David. Thank you. Thank you so much for that generous presentation, Mac. Uh, thank you for inviting me to the Vision Critic, Critic Series, Lara Butler Hughes. Thank you also for coordinating of the schedule, Jabe and Sharita for co-hosting, Megan, Tanas, Sam, Sharita, Patricia, Carl, Garrick, Garima, and Terry for opening your studios and showing me your fantastic work in the past three or four weeks. Finally, to the PNCA's Halliford of Graduate Studies, uh, uh, Center for Graduate Studies for hosting tonight's event and the PNCA, the University of Oregon Center for Arts Research, PSU, and the Ford Family Foundation, of course, for their generous support and making this program possible. Okay, I need to start my presentation, which I will do momentarily. Uh, where is my slides? It's taking a bit, I have a thousand things open. Okay, maybe I will just share my screen. Very sorry. Just do this. Okay, here we are. Is my presentation visible? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Okay, I'll start while the computer decides to let me. So, um, oh, it's not letting me actually. Tech issues, why not? Okay, so um, I'll just present from here. So my talk borrows the title from Daniel Spoyeris, An Anecdotal Topography of Chance. As the structure of my argument and topics, uh, the topics I will discuss are conceived similarly. The examples of, uh, the, that spark this entire reflection are mainly chance encounters in which I apply both creative and critical operations in order to create a series of thoughts on the origin and the politics of institutional collecting. They came to me before I went looking for them. And the annotations that follow, just as in Spoiler's book, are not only my creative input, in mainly connections with history and popular culture, which are uh, somewhat my speciality, but also the hints and threads and suggested by friends, colleagues, and to authors that have helped me to shape these ideas for some time. Spoiler's book is both creative and playful and deep, deeply concerned with materiality not only in a philosophical sense, but rather in a way that elevates the most innocuous and mundane objects into, into the center of an investigation that opens multiple escape routes and forms of thinking. It relies in the slight nuances of experiences of the world of different individuals, as well as the minimal deviations in the vectors of social agreement that allow our world to be a collective one. My talk, in many ways, is all about this.
A breadth of recent art projects have taken interest in material culture, heritage, and archaeology as means for reflecting on the overflowing materiality of our contemporary world and the meaning of producing new objects in this context, as well as to respond to the progressive disruption of the cultural and the environmental that characterizes late capitalism. The aim of this talk is to address such concerns from a political ecological approach, that is, attending both to the materiality of the artistic practices studied here and to the cultural issues in which they are inscribed to open avenues for reflection into the many transformations and ripple effects they create. Topics such as the cultural, the political, and the ecological are addressed by tracing lineages of cultural practices and their implications to provide an analysis that exceeds the more traditional avenues of ideological and institutional critique. The analysis takes place uh, through a comparative study of two recent installations that were featured in Made in LA, the Los Angeles Biennial, uh, an exhibition that surveys the artistic practices of the region city of Los Angeles, California, Genial Small Excavation II and Gala Porras' King's Untitled Installation. Small, as well as other artists I will mention today, are also part of my traveling show, Never Spoken Again, wrote stories of science and collections, which uh, Mac Kind, kindly introduced uh, a bit earlier. The show is produced by Independent Curators International and it's traveling through the US and abroad until 2023. The next stop will be at the Jepson Center, part of the Telfair Museums in Savannah, Georgia this June. The cases of Small and Porous Scheme uh, are illustrative of contrasting strategies for addressing the problem of heritage from the perspective of contemporary art as they create forms of implicit and explicit criticality of archaeological collection and exhibition practices. Small and porous team constitute different forms of resistance to hegemonic narratives of preservation and storytelling around museum collections, while taking different approaches to materiality, value, and collecting. The presentation of each, each example in this chapter is, in, is then enriched by other artistic examples that complicate the discussion in production ways and allow the reflection to bleed into different geographies. The main argument revolves around the idea of collecting, both as means for creation and destruction, but it also inquires on the role of the artistic and the political in further creating opportunities for generation or obliteration through the processes of framing a collection narrative. Excavation 2, a large-scale museographic installation by Daniel Small, presents a series of objects from the archaeological excavation of the Guadalupe Nipono Dunes in California, three hours north of the city of Los Angeles. The objects we cover on the site are fragments of the scenography created by Cecil B. DeMille's 1923 film, The Ten Commandments, which narrates the biblical story of the Exodus, along with a fable that depicts a modern interpretation of the Judeo-Christian text. The dunes serve as a giant set film for the Mills vision, who decided to destroy the vast scenography upon completion of the film to prevent other directors from reusing it in the future. In the last few decades, the fragments have been retrieved by archaeologists who have organized small expeditions to salvage the objects buried in the dunes in an effort to preserve the material history of this place. 90 years later, the natural reserve became an unintended archaeological site that preserves the cultural memory, not of ancient Egypt during the reign of Ramses II, but of a cinematographic recreation of it. Analog to religious paintings, the Mills film updates the images that constitute the biblical narrative in the collective imagery as one of its first major cinematographic representations. It inaugurates and stabilizes a certain gaze on these stories, now in the more evocative medium of a moving image a multi-sensorial experience that lends a more comprehensive form to the narrative and one which has also the capacity of reaching larger audiences. The obsession with the images of the past that leads some, somewhere between fascination with what is ungraspable in the present is commonly illustrated in the, by the recurring metaphor of the angel of history, found in Walter Benjamin's thesis, uh, thesis on the philosophies of history and the passion for ruins, the nostalgic settlement of a mythical past that underpins the present. The English expression folly denominates the ornamental constructions that were built throughout Europe, starting from the 18th century English gardens and then spreading through the continent. These constructions represented fragments of ancient buildings, mainly from the Gothic era, and had the particularity of being built in a false state of ruin. 
because these structures merely have an ornamental function, we can say that there's a certain delight in the ruin halfway between the aesthetic and the spiritual. The Gothic ruin evokes an idealized past that captures imagination while providing a mythical origin and meaning to a cultural space. As in the case of the European folly and Gothic style restoration, uh, the Guadalupe Nicomo dunes actively produce a mythical tale that renders historic and patrimonial density to the place that shelters the buried objects. The mill's destruction gesture had the direct effect of preserving these objects in time, a possibility that did not escape the director. In his autobiography, the mill wrote, and I quote, if in a thousand years from now, archeologists happen to dig beneath the sands of Guadalupe, I hope that they will not rush into print with the amazing news that the Egyptian civilization, far from being confined to the valley of the Nile, extended all the way to the Pacific coast of North America, End of quote. These visionary words help us understand the desire of the director for this ironic form of transcendence, but also from American culture uh, of building a collective memory around their own cultural universe. By the mid twenties, the thriving industry of American cinema constituted a testimony of the economic and political impetus of a nation that then would go to consolidate as a global power after World War II, two decades later. The epic proportions of the Ten Commandments captured in the collective cultural and spiritual imagination, uh, they also celebrated the great economic and productive potential of the American industry. This became ever more evident in the acceleration of the urban development of the Western districts of Los Angeles, which responded to the infrastructural demands of the monumental scale of Hollywood cinema and evolved with the flow of wealth associated with the film industry. Furthermore, Cecil B. Mill's uh, films inaugurated many of the production conventions of historic and epic film that developed after the 1920s, and that then went, went well beyond the passing of the director until the full emergence of computer-generated imagery or CGI. By reconstituting the materiality of the excavation to the strategy of the museum display, small work acknowledges the ecology of factors involved in transforming the destroyed film set into a collection of objects ripe for history. In particular, excavation two illustrates how the persistence of matter in a fragmented form sets into motion different processes of value, accumulation, beautifully illustrated by the writings of Jane Bennett. In her book, Vibrant Matter, the philosopher and political theorist described how worms have played a significant role in the preservation of historical artifacts. By examining Charles Darwin and Bruno Latour's studies on the topic, Bennett explains that the worms create vegetable mold as a product of digesting different materials and soil. This process eventually creates new layers of soil that are assimilated by the ground and progressively bury, bury human-made objects and constructions that were on surface. How do worms make history, she asks. They make it by making vegetable mold, which makes possible seedlings of all kinds, which makes possible an earth hospitable to humans, which makes possible the cultural artifacts, rituals, plants, endeavors of human history. Worms also make history by preserving the artifacts that humans made. Worms protect for an indifferent long period every object not liable to decay, which is dropped on the surface of the land by burying it beneath their castings, a service for which archaeologists ought to be grateful to worms. Bennett, considering Latour, also remembers that the worms have the ability to transform the conditions of the soil. By adding or transporting moisture, the minerals or organic materials, soil can become more liable to host certain vegetable compounds, therefore stimulating the emergence of specific ecosystems. Because of this, and although we perceive them as static, the limits between a forest and a meadow could be, transform could be transforming constantly. Due to the agency of worms, the forest can advance over the meadows and vice versa, according to the changes and the conditions of the soil. Such changes precipitate the prosperity or decadence of diverse vegetable species and transitively of animals that could transform history according to the possibilities of survival of a given ecosystem with availability and potential for settlement in a specific area. Although intentional, the actions of Darwin's worms equally to the meal's gesture as uh, Jane Bennett interprets, and then uh, Daniel Small as well, uh, become, they become agents of history by preserving objects that beyond their speculated cultural value, they are simply there, available for discovery for later generations and other cultures. 
that availability of certain cultural artifacts or the lack thereof determines the course of scientific investigation as well as the intellectual, social, affective, ritual, and psychic value of an object, its original culture, and the space where it proliferated. Because of this, the contribution of sedentary cultures prone to produce objects with developed written traditions tend to have more representation in history than those with nomadic practices, therefore with a more limited material culture and orally centered historic tradition. Beyond the, the archaeological component, Small's installation included five large-scale paintings that depicted scenes from the age in Egypt. These images are referenced by the artist in the exhibition catalog. The source of the paintings is the Luxor Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, a pyramidal construction saturated with Egyptian imagery, including a great sphinx on its facade. As mentioned by Small, in 2007, the hotel and casino removed its theme decoration in response to a legis legislative act that took place in Egypt to protect intellectual property on their archaeological sites, temples, and statues, forcing to pay royalties to anyone that would reproduce these images and artifacts or use their names. Small notes that days before the sanctioning of the new legislation, the Egyptian newspaper Al Waft had published this curious fact that the hotel in Las Vegas reported more visitors than the historic site from which it took its name. The money obtained from, from royalties was meant to contribute to the maintenance of the historical site and the artifacts, but the hotel owning group, MGM Resorts International, decided to remove the theme material from its hotel as much as possible. Small description continues with an analysis of the images that formerly occupied the walls of the hotel in Las Vegas, and on the sites representing scenes from the biblical tale of the Ten Commandments, they also contain as hidden, uh, things like hidden hieroglyphs that, uh, hieroglyphs that intermix historically accurate characters with modern symbology, including images of alien spaceships, the resurrection of Christ, dinosaurs, casino playing cards, and personal messages from the paintings. Both the acrylic paintings from the Luxor and the uh, hotel and casino and the cast and wooden pieces from the film set at the Guadalupe and Ipoma Dunes recreate a history that, while built upon narratives and iconology from the ancient past, like the Christian Bible and the civilizations of ancient Egypt, did they create a new brand of past um, or a mythology composed of a culture of cultural mashups. Las Vegas and the Hollywood film industry constitute major icons or of milestone eras in American popular culture of a large part of the 20th century, which had their golden age between the 1920s and the 1950s, and today found themselves in a period of decline in the collective imagery. Hunter S. Thompson's novel Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas is this delirious depiction of the K uh, of the American culture and cultural movement set in a baroque and rotten city of Las Vegas, where the splendor and luxury of the American dream has become stale and a digestible version of themselves. Similarly, the film industry has suffer, suffered rapid transformation during the last three decades, making way onto, to on-demand content, a plethora of remakes and overindulgent digital effects, and movie theaters with exuberant amenities in an attempt to curb the steady decline of attendance to film theaters. The golden age of Hollywood is behind us and now it's part of an idealized past that crystallized in the architecture of the 20th century Los Angeles, notoriously in the many semi-abandoned theaters on Broadway Street in the downtown area, but also in the archeological remains found in the Guadalupe and Ipoma dunes. Both Small and the writer and director Peter Brosnan, who in 2016 completed a film on the Guadalupe Nipomo ruins, the lost city of Cecil B. Mill, describe how the fragments and the dunes have become a popular cultural ma uh, culture marvel, how it's possible to find fragments of the archeological artifacts in houses and retail stores of the area, and how some enthusiasts have dedicated themselves to put together private collections and to create derived objects. Archaeologist Jack Green comments how, for example, there is a small exhibition of the ruins embedded to a store called Napa Auto Parts, where the pieces share vitrines with accessories and spare parts for vehicles, and where sometimes it is difficult to distinguish which pieces are part of the original set and which ones have been included into the collection spontaneously or by mistake. The improvised uh, exhibition, as well as the eclectic use of the space at Napa Auto Parts in Guadalupe, speak broadly to the speculation with the value that is involved in the collections as the objects become more significant through the act of being collected. It, is all, it also makes visible some of the contingencies that shape our historical narrations, for example, which, which objects are preserved and which aren't, 
and under which circumstances these decisions are made. And finally, it reveals how the fragments whimsically sneak into historical reports, like in the case of Napa Auto Parts, where the objects from the ruins are confounded with objects that have been added to the collection only because they look similar to those that came from the dunes. Accounts of history and memory are rarely linear. Fragments of the past are often mixed with other information that is contingently added in the process, whether from the subjective experience of the account or from the unforeseeable factors involved in sourcing and remembering information. They ultimately combine, they combine in this strange amalgam that constitutes the present perspective of the past. For the inhabitants of Guadalupe, as well as for the researchers and enthusiasts of the ruins of the Ten Commandments, what was found in the dunes is described as a mythical narrative that does not correspond to the biblical tale, nor, repre nor not the represented site. It is a new history created over the multiple layers of signification that unfolded between the historical period of ancient Egypt and the flourishing of the cinematographic industry of Southern California. This narrative exists as a current interpretation of, a histori of historical events, along with the attribution of certain mythical qualities that come from the way on which the facts are evaluated. The geographical and historical proximity or remoteness, the possibility or lack thereof of attributing archaeological interest to the place and the objects, and even the historical tendencies related to cultural appeal of a particular object. The contemporary passion for intellectual operations like re-evaluation and reinterpretation or for issues like the replica, the derived product, and popular culture can contribute to the mythification of the story, which began with the construction of the film set, film set for the Ten Commandments. Moreover, the contingency that connects these interests in the present and their coincidence with the, cause, uh, the case of the Guadalupe Nipomo ruins is a great example of how the attribution of value is seemingly unpredictable as the way in which memory takes shape inside the human mind. But perhaps the most relevant factor that contributes to the identification of value of a cultural object is the threat of its disappearance. And I look to the way uh, social psychology is instrumented in the consumer goods market to the, the drive desire through portraying scarcity, attention between preservation and disappearance is put in the service of power narratives of cultural institutions. This, for example, allows for the stereotypical colonial trope employed by Western museums to defend their so-called right to appropriate cultural artifacts to their presumed unique ability to preserve, uh, but to better preserve them, while at the same time profiting socially and economically from them. But the threat of disappearance of a cultural artifact also detonates a number of effects on their nature and significance. The acts of preservation and other related operations like destruction, resignification, restoration, standardization, profoundly transform the nature of the preserved object, and there is no great no greater return to preservation than the increasing of value derived from the act or enactment of salvaging the object from an otherwise certain disappearance. Since the mid-1920s, uh, 1990s, I'm sorry, the Taliban Sunni Islamic fundamentalist political and military organization have attempted to destroy the cultural and spiritual icons that themselves perceive as the exogenous and therefore dangerous to Islam. For example, on March 2001, the Taliban destroyed the Bamiyan Buddhas, two monumental sculptures carved in the cliffs of the Bamiyan Valley, some 230 kilometers north of Kabul, Afghanistan. These direct attacks on particular representations of the past not only caused generalized international outrage, but they also generated debates within the global archaeologist communities on how to protect the material uh, witness uh, on our collective memories, specifically the difficult ones. Among the debated questions that follow the destruction of the Bamiyan structures and other similarly contested ones. Should the sculptures be reconstructed? Or perhaps is the destruction part of the historical continuum of the Buddhas and the region and therefore rebuilt should not be attempted? In the book Textual Parity, American artist Joseph Wrigley analyzes how artworks and literary texts undergo changes as part of their process of dissemination. A text might be reprinted with modifications due to censorship or translation, and this produces effects on, on its reception. An annotated or an abbreviated version might be written afterwards, or a theater or film adaptation may be written in time, opening new avenues for meaning as well as additional visual, narrative, or interpretive elements. Therefore, 
a text becomes the sum of its multiple versions. Similarly, a work of art that undergoes decay due to environmental conditions or changes throughout restoration, handling, information, transportation, or defacement. Uh, it can also be reinterpreted that critics or new artists, or it can become tra a trade image of popular culture, as it so often happens. All of the latter transform the original constitution of the work and ultimately the experience of the spectator with the work in time. Additionally, the direct products of these works, like reproductions, copies, photographs, texts, etc., add to the constellation of uh, experiences, reactions, and interpretations generated by a certain piece. For quickly, a work is not uh, its materiality in a pure or original state, just as it is conceived by the author. Rather, it is constituted by the sum of its materiality, its transformations, and additions to time. The fact that polychrome Greek sculptures are no longer polychrome and lack noses and an occasional arm or leg does not so much detract from their status as art, but add to, the, to it perhaps even define it. A quote by Greekly. The perspective offered by Greekly allows us to multiply the reach of small gestures. If the archaeological approach highlights the material culture of the human group of a place, it is also necessary to incorporate to this analysis, a tracing of the relationships with non-physical aspects that have an effect on that materiality. Small installation cannot be read without bearing in mind aspects like the temporal distance between the production of the object and the moment of its assessment and valuing as an archaeological issue, the cultural and spiritual value as a myth of origin of the imagery in the Mills film, and even the cultural and the material perspective of the specific time on which the reflection takes place. The first decades of the 21st century seem to be a moment on which human frontiers are put to a test. In the last 10 or 15 years, social regressions and material excesses of capitalism and military industry have generated a stark interest for reevaluating re the promise of an exhaustible scientific, technological, and economic development. Climate change, the overflow of large scale agriculture, and industrial production, armed conflict, and the consequences of social inequity have made evident the finitude of physical resources, soil of human culture. Once the material excess has been exhausted and in the midst of an accelerated process of widespread economic precariousness, the reconsideration and reuse of matter acquires prime relevance. This is reflected in the growing uses of recycled materials and the renewable energies in different kinds of manufacturing. It also has repercussions in popular culture, now attracted to secondhand and upscale clothing, vintage objects, cinematographic remakes and mashups, and an overall attraction to imagery of the past. Beyond academic and patrimonial interest, the cult to the past conquers diverse realms of life, uh, from an old TV show uh, redistributed to streaming platforms and pret a porter clothing that pays tribute to the 1990s fashion, to the re-editing of cultural milestones like the mythical exhibition's primary structures, when attitude becomes form, documenta five, or culture in action, that were recently continued, revisited, or commemorated with some other exhibitions, academic forums, and publications. In the world of hyperconsumption, the idea of a past progressively compresses the historical continue to lend historical and patrimonial value to the new cultural objects and events, no matter how recent or relevant they are. The digitalization of music and literature highlights the, com uh, the complexities and challenges behind systemic and hasty preservation. The pages of Project Gutenberg and the albums of iTunes and Spotify libraries constitute a remarkable accumulation of cultural material. However, in some cases, this only survived primarily as signs. The modeling of databases where the works are stored preserves only a specific and therefore a limited set of qualities. For example, meta information like author, year, cover, and main content. And in the case of the music albums or the unformatted text with uh, scramble or lost order of pages and figures, uh, in the case of books. In the effort of preserving many of these materials, they are flattened and simplified by the limits in the design of the databases and authoring software. When a cultural object is subtracted from its original space, the material and immaterial values of its production uh, as well as the narrative on which the object is framed, is, uh, all of that is controlled by the way in which the materials are preserved, the form and the context of the collection or archive, and the discourse behind it. The cultural value of an object is radically determined by the specific participation in a cultural space. In the digital era, meta-information substitutes the context in an insuffi insufficient way, 
transforming the interpretation of the object and therefore its understanding and relevance. The issue of contextual value of a cultural artifact is explored by the Colombian Korean artist Gala Porreskin in her untitled installation presented at Made in LA. Porras came with a series of pieces from UCLA's Fowler Museum uh, to, to raise questions about the reach of the museographic device as an agent of preservation of material culture. The objects, which were selected in collaboration with the Fowler team, lacked a proper identification and therefore their date of production, precise materials, or provenance remain unknown. The situation rendered their, their insertion in the anthropological collection of the museum impossible. Each of the objects or a group of objects is presented on a plinth with a uh, blue wool surface forming straight rows uh, on the entire regular base. The central space is reserved for larger objects raised on a second plinth. This collection is composed of wooden, stone, and bone carvings, as well as ceramics and weavings of different fibers. The second part of the installation consists of drawings uh, of diverse dimensions displayed on four walls of the exhibition space at the Hammer Museum. The drawings visualize memories from the collection installed in the middle of the space, while a mosaic of small drawings depicting many of small scale objects occupying one of the walls, larger drawings occupy the other three walls. All of the drawings were made by the artists and resembled scientific depictions of biological entities and historical artifacts. Finally, the installation was cataloged into printouts that, that were made available at the entrance of the room, introducing visitors to an additional layer of uh, details about the origin and color characteristics of the exhibited objects. When inspecting the information condensed in the printouts and the installation diagram, an information previously un, uh, unnoticed comes to attention. Some of the objects of the installation were fabricated by the artists, particularly the larger sized ones in the central area of the collection. These objects are placed in a similar fashion to those lent by the Fowler Museum, and there doesn't seem to be any significant difference in the way that they are presented. If noticeably, the objects created by Porras Kim are larger in scale. The decision of placing them in the middle seems to obey, at first appearance, the reasons of efficiency and order in visualization. The decision, um, the densely organized in rows uh, on a single wall, uh, the drawings, while the larger drawings occupy the longer walls with more space in between them. Each drawing is a one-on-one -on -one scale representation uh, of the object in reference. Horace's scheme installation holds a, a different ambition to that of Daniel Smalls. If in the previously referenced case uh, of excavation two, the artist appealed to museographic strategies to highlight the value rendered to objects by its process of ruination and later becoming part of a collection, the opposite takes place in the second case. Through her installation, Boris Kim showed how the process of collecting is also a process of destruction. Just in the case, uh, just like in the case of digital music and literature repositories, the instant an object is subtracted from its cultural matrix, it begins to rely in the metadata set that is gathered and preserved alongside. When this data disappears, the value of the object is crucially destroyed. Or as a scheme installation ironizes over the paradoxical nature of the collection inside of the Encyclopedic Museum, the institution garners uh, importance through its collection, which in turn is composed of objects torn from the original context. In the didactic materials of Encyclopedic Museum, like the Art Institute of Chicago or the Neues Museum in Berlin, uh, a visitor learns that the exhibited objects are important because they belong to a specific geographical, temporal, and cultural origin. Ironically, that very specificity and context needs to be destroyed in order to bring the collection into life. The collection is therefore of a different nature than the sum of its parts. It's a narrative effort to give meaning to the process of extraction, but one that defers the responsibility of dealing with the implications of that very process. When looking at donation records uh, in museum bulletins, it is common to find gaps in the histories that goes between the extraction of the object on, and its arrival to the museum. These gaps are deliberate and have the effect of shielding an institution and its benefactors of the ethical, ethical implications of extraction of objects uh, with heritage value from their places of origin, in many cases, illegal and colonial. Uh, as historia, uh, historian and theorist Susan Leib claims, even today, 
Museums assume the metonymy that the possession of relics belonging to so-called civilizations is in itself a proof of civilization. However, as it is brought forth by Forrest King's work, the implications of that possession are broad and often have disastrous consequences. Here, the museums and their displaying practices that separate, organize, and refray cultural artifacts become instrumental in the cleansing of the complex and violent histories of extraction. Furthermore, by producing ambiguity in the lineages of heritage objects and their trajectory into the institution, the very practice of collecting creates uncertain degrees of separation that reframe history for the purpose of instrumentalization. The destruction of the original narrative is a process that links colonial, scientific, political, trade, and military institutions with cultural ones. This takes, places, uh, this takes place through a complex process of separation and confusion that dilutes the ethical responsibility by disaggregating the systems of extraction and colonization into useful categories, politics, art, cultural heritage, natural history, natural resources, and so on. The question about uh, collections that springs from the work of Porras King uh, calls for a broader epistemological inquiry on how disciplines create discrete objects of study that favor the growing of specialized knowledge but work in detriment of the ecology of lineages, interactions, and repercussions of the cultural materials that they are the very source of the interest. The comparison between the gestures of small and poor scheme is also productive to formulate questions on the interaction between cultural objects and artistic gestures. The first case, the collecting practice represented by the museographic device constitutes an agent of creation and preservation. The second, the staging of the decontextualized collection makes use of the museographic device to bring forth its own destructive capacity. However, Porras King performs an additional operation that questions the strategy of meta-referentiality of collection. By inserting objects of, their own of her own making, uh, the artist requests additional attention from the spectator, not only towards the archaeological objects and the museographical device, but also to her own craft. By inserting her own objects, probably identified within the selection of objects from the Fowler, Porras King offers a reflection, a reflection perhaps as paradoxical as the acts of appropriation of encyclopedic museums. Does this gesture respond to an implicit demand of our practice to produce new objects or performing some convincing transformation or appropriation of culture as a requisite to render value to the artistic gesture? What further meaning is offered by the act of inserting these new elements in the collection? A possible answer to these questions can be discerned by looking at three further examples of contemporary art, the works of Michael Rakowitz, Morishin Alahiari, and Ulrich Lopez. The first two works, who enjoy great international recognition, address the massive disappearance of heritage objects from Iraq and the Mediterranean countries, caused by uh, multiple consequences of, uh, of the multiple consequences of several invasions of Iraq that were perpetrated by the United States during the past three decades, and so on. The work of Lopez, who is a, a remarkable emerging artist of Mexican and Puerto Rican origin, is in turn focused on understanding the dissonance between the cultural usage of heritage objects in their context of emergence and their eventual transformation by means of their inclusion in a museographic display. In the continuing seri series, The Invisible Enemy Should Not Exist, that is pictured here uh, as part of the installation of my exhibition, Never Spoken Again, uh, Rakowitz recreates looted objects from the National Museum of Iraq in Baghdad using packaging of Middle Eastern foodstuff and, and local newspapers. These objects are the, then presented in contemporary art exhibitions, uh, inserted in archaeological and ethnographic collections or displayed as public sculptures. Alejari's project, Material Speculation, ISIS, uses materi uh, archive materials, crowdsourced, crowdsourced imagery, and expert accounts to reconstruct 12 original figures destroyed by ISIS in 2015, using 3D printing techniques. The resulting sculpture also carry flash drives uh, and memory cards with the archival material that resorted, uh, resulted from this forensic process. Finally, uh, in his work, Summon Song 1, Lopez forges an archeological excavation uh, and a series of ceramics to create an installation that reincorporates the elements lost to the insertion of the objects into a museum display, in particular, their activation through sound. Both the, uh, the excavation and the ceramics hold the capacity of resonance, indicating that they were meant to interact with sound, creating a relationship between the body, the artifact, and the space, 
by means of the human voice. The projects of Michael Rakowitz, Morishina Lagiari, and Ulrich Lopez may use of, uh, make use of artistic gestures to resist different forms of destruction. In the case of Rakowitz and Lagiari, their work exposes the relative impossibility of a definitive obliteration of a heritage artifact as it survives through the, all the material and immaterial forms of reproduction and documentation available to the human culture of the 21st century. They are then brought into material form, now carrying all the historical trajectory of the object. But they also infuse new layers of meaning through the, re uh, the research, production, and display practices, creating further cultural resonance for the objects that were originally, quote unquote, destroyed. Interestingly, they create an additional focus of criticality by interfering with the process of speculation that characterizes the accumulation of heritage objects, where scarcity increases the cultural and economic value of the remaining pieces in existence. In a different direction, Lopez mimics sanctioned forms of procuring and displaying heritage to express the limits of archaeological and institutional collecting practices and how they erase the entire cultural ecology surrounding the collected objects and even destroy or deactivate the, the objects themselves, even as their material components still rest inside the vitrines. As in the case of Porras Kim, these three works raise a major question on the relevance of continuing the practices of subtracting heritage from their cultural matrix uh, to be placed in collections and museum displays in the present. To practices of appropriation, reconstruction, and recontextualization that creates a vivid dialogue with institutions and disciplines and urges them to reformulate the validity of their current forms of existence and their methods. It could be claimed that the gestures that gave birth to a given cultural artifact imply that uh, what are now understood as typical intellectual operations of artistic creation, representation, illustration, combination, irony, and critique. However, it is through the intricate metabolism of culture, science, economy, and politics how these gestures become significant. Notably, the collecting and the scientific apparatuses are prim primordial agents in this valuation process, as they broadly understood as keepers of knowledge, culture, and heritage in favor of communities, nations, and even the entire human culture. Therefore, the practices of artists like Small, Porraskin, and others mentioned in this text, in, in this, um, text become particularly significant, not only because they engage with the issues of collecting and preserving cultural heritage, but also because they address complex micro uh, uh, and macro dynamics involving the creation of collections of value. They resist a tendency in recent art of abandoning the institutional space in search for conquering new cultural and ideological realms, and they re return to address the institution with full impetus. Small's installation explores the genesis and life of the archaeological object in all density, revealing how this process fractures the integrity of the scientific endeavor and exposing the politics that determine the rendering of heritage value to a cultural artifact. In turn, Porras scheme work makes visible uh, how the acts of this extracting and collecting privilege both the scientific process and the institution in detriment of the objects themselves and their original cultural matrix. It is particularly significant to acknowledge how artistic operations performed by these artists present, uh, presented here not only make evident uh, the inherent conflicts, both conceptual and political, existing in the practices of extraction, collecting, and heritage preservation, but also create further semantic operations on their reference materiality that complicate their understanding and create forms of knowledge that may not be accessible to more disciplined avenues of research. In this sense, the, these works do not act merely as evidence or illustration, but as distinct intellectual statements that are connected through their dialogue and through curatorial research, and then activated via their presentation and experience. While these projects have the false appearance of seemingly traditional works in uh, art uh, works of art in museum contexts, they resist the inertia of institutional and disciplinary self-preservation to open productive avenues for reformulations of theory and practice that curb their own ethical and intellectual pitfalls. Furthermore, a, a critique performed through the operations of materiality demonstrate the possibilities of that very materiality of enacting a different agency of that of the theoretical or the literary interpretation. A reformulation of approaches of issues of collecting, preserving heritage involves envisioning future forms of engagement that go beyond intradisciplinary means of critique as well as politics of inclusion and decolonization. 
It requires an understanding of how the trajectories of disciplinary evolution imply an acknowledgement of the limitations brought into light by the art projects studied here, but also an awareness that the keys to overcome such deficits are already exist, not only in the recomposition of more encompassing narratives, but equally in doing so by means of the many forms of knowledge that exceed preconceived methodologies and scientific canon. Thank you. Thanks so much, David. That was amazing. Um, I think we're going to just start with some good back and forth between Sharita and I. And then if folks have questions and they want to put them in the Q&A or the chat, feel free. Um, we'd love to kind of get into some of this with you all. I love the way you wrap this up um, on, a, on, a, on a bit of a hopeful note, or at least a note that like the there is this sort of way forward um, and that there's a, a way in which is that it's like kind of already there before us. And there's like some examples of that practice taking place. Um, and, but I am sort of left with the question of like, can there ever, or like what, what are the real limitations towards creating uh, like collections or displaying collections that not circumnavigate, but that like address in some sort of way of some sort of no notion of equity um, to some of the ideas around like critical heritage that you're presenting. Like, is, is that even possible within like a, a Western scenario? Oh, I think so, yes. Um, I think some of those strategies have been kind of highlighted by some of the artists that I already presented here, and so many artists that I, for example, happened to, to meet uh, during my, my virtual tour of, uh, you know, like Oregon. Um, and one of them is, uh, you know, like uh, relying on the possibility of copying, of reproducing, of creating replicas, and so on. My, I think my first experiences uh, at museums, at certain museums, were kind of a deceit in some way because um, you would find a lot of replicas of you know the Museum of Natural History would have like replicas of mammals and so on and so forth and uh, and then the same with so many other uh, with so many other collections and uh, my first reaction was that but um, in time uh, there it makes you think about the the purposes of the institution uh, that probably are not necessarily garnering value for the objects themselves because the objects have to be evaluated in the context that they come from, uh, but rather create like this context of uh, appearance for creating uh, an engagement and educational experience and so on. So, so I think there are already strategies in place, there are already solutions, there are already um, things that we can do. Uh, and there are collections that are already, uh, that have been already created and it's, it's kind of absurd and ironic to think that many of those things can be kind of like turned back into their own context. Some of them can, but in so many, in so many cases, like what happened with the, the work of Gala Porraskin, they won't be able to return to, you know, like there's no context to them. Uh, so I think, um, I think there needs to be that this uh, cross disciplinary and social responsibility towards how the object is presented rather than disrupting collections as they are. Um, it is, it is um, I think it's rather a strange experience to, um, like when you witness uh, objects like say, they were sourced from my own country and then you go to an exhibition. Uh, I think the experience of that is, um, I think it's disruptive. And uh, I think if you have that such thing, such artifacts in your, in your power, uh, you have a, you know, like this more responsibility to, to create like, further uh, acknowledgements of how these things came to be there um, and not just ignore them, like willfully ignore them. Um, um, I, I don't think the institutions need to, you know, like be destroyed or whatever. They just need to understand that 
their, their mission and their mandate goes well beyond what they're trying to do. Um, I was interested in the the Grigley um, text that you showed and, and talked about and weaved into your um, your talk, and I was thinking about another Grigley text, um, exhibition prosthetics, and so I was hoping that you could talk about kind of how you see the disruption or intervention into you know a kind of more traditional approach to exhibition prosthetics and museums um, can be useful to us in this time. So the, the Korean artist that you showed, for example, that was a really, I think a really interesting um, feedback loop between kind of disrupting the, the um, you know, usual display or placards and kind of having those shadowed drawings kind of asking, putting us in a position of like, what am I looking at and who put it here and all these kinds of things. Um, yeah, mostly my question, it's a rambly question, but yeah, how can, how can these, um, you know, museums or these places that are more encyclopedic in their, in their presentation of, of these artifacts and, and monuments and things, what can they what can they use to actually put place next to or present this work that can disrupt these these systems a bit more? Well, I think the answer is basically art. Um, I think the artists that I presented and so many others that I can, I can think of, they make such a good job um, creating this uh, context of criticality for the objects already that it's not, I, I think it's not, you know, canon for like museographic practices, but if you like in, involve artists in these processes of creating such narratives, they already know, like they already have this sense of criticality and a lot of visual arguments and a lot of material arguments uh, that can create a context of presentation that is way richer. Uh, makes me think of, for example, um, this monument in Mexico City that is called Monumento a la Madre, uh, Monumento the Mother, uh, you know, like is this very patriarchal, uh, uh, object uh, that says like something uh, like uh, I think in the plane it says something like um, uh, you know like this evocation of like to the mother and whatever and then some artists created like another uh, message and put and like inserted like guerrilla style in like in the bottom of it that says like because she wanted to you know so that's how you kind of like transform uh, but, but you know creating these small artistic gestures uh, you know, like these patriarchal symbols or the symbols that lack criticality or lack context into something very interesting, like without, you know, destroying them or like without acknowledging that they were already there because they are indeed history as well. So, so you know, I think those exhibitions, for example, that create a lot of prosthetics, but also a lot of artistic interventions or reactions to works, especially heritage works are very uh, productive and useful and interesting and successful in, in creating that context. Yeah, that I mean, when you were talking about some of these artists and some of these practices, and even in the, the response to the first question, um, just thinking of like the local context, like Sarah Seastrom's work came to mind, where she, you know, has this proposal basically to all the the museums around here that, you know, as a as an indigenous artist herself, she will uh, help weave and work to find other weavers to create. Um, new objects for these museums if they would repatriate their old objects um, so that those could go back to the tribes to be um, basically uh, dealt with as the way the tribes want to, to deal with them. Um, and I, there is a way forward, I think, that, that art and artistic practice can point towards. Um, and, I, and I also, though, appreciated your, um, your kind of call out of Hollywood culture that is like very obsessed with itself. Um, and that artistic culture also has the same problem with like these recreations, you know, like, uh, well, in Hollywood's case, it's like how so many Oscar nominations and winners are films about Hollywood. Um, and that it, within the art world, there's a lot of attention paid to these recreations, like uh, your example of at when attitude becomes forms. Um, and I'm just, just thinking about like our blind spots um, within this where we do get a little self-obsessed and nostalgic. Um, like we have a little bit of our own MAGA um, sensibility maybe 
um, within the art world um, and within visual culture um, that we we need to somehow like shake off. Uh, and I and I'm not sure artistic practice is actually that practice, or if actually all disciplines have this kind of need to be navel gazing. Um, and I'm not really sure there's a question in there, but I am just trying to like piece together uh, like when I leave here, like where where are the where are the things I'm going to go dig into to to try to shake off some of that um, our own MAGA sensibilities. Well, I think part of the answer to that question that was like that I can dig from what you said um, has to do with contamination. Um, many of the things that happen or that created interest in in some of the work that I show, like uh, like Daniel Small's work have to do with cultural practices that have nothing to do with, you know, like traditional avenues of creation. If someone decides that some objects are interesting or are uh, valuable and they decide to create their own, you know, like impromptu practice of collection, then that brings some new information on how the culture is perceiving a, a certain phenomena. Uh, that's uh, that on that, mm, um, I guess on that idea, but also, um, uh, I forgot where I was going. Um, I think there is a like three layers of obsession and fetish with objects that we have as cultural practitioners and be it designers, artists, uh, cultural workers that have to do with heritage and so on. Um, we have um, this intermingle of uh, aesthetic fixation, sociological, uh, fixation and economic interest that create like this un unbreakable like fetish and unbreakable link with the objects and I think sometimes we ha just have to let go I mean um, the ex excuse for museums not to deliver uh, looted goods to back to their countries of origin is that they, they might be destroyed and at some point I don't really care uh, maybe that's part of the trajectory of the object. The, the object existed and we have so many technologies that we already used to study and capture and, and uh, moralize, uh, if, if you may, uh, the objects and they need to follow the, whatever trajectory they need to follow. And I think uh, we need to just let ourselves, you know, like, or let the objects undergo that process, whatever that may be. Um, with that, um, well, first, before I ask my question, I want to encourage folks that are here to type some questions in the Q&A, because um, we'll start to, to take some of those questions soon. Um, but on that last sentiment, I'm, I'm thinking about the, the slides that you showed around the threat of destruction and kind of looking at that and thinking of that, you know, the, the historical moment in which those um, those statues were made 2000 years versus the historical moment now of them being destroyed. And I wanted to draw a parallel to, you know, the geography that I live within in Portland and seeing, you know, a much shorter time span. So like a hundred years or, or even less with a lot of the statues, you know, those uh, monuments and things coming down um, in black, the Black Lives Matter movement last summer and through the year um, and so, yeah, I was just curious if you could kind of speak to, um, you know, this idea of something reaching its moment, you know, being in a trajectory of history and reaching a moment of it being destroyed. What is the, who is being threatened? Who is doing the threatening? Like, where does power lie with, um, both within the object that is being taken down or defaced? Uh, or with the people that are doing the defacing and who is good and who is bad. I'm just asking all these questions um, as I try to draw the examples that you showed to me, um, which through, you know, my own lens of, of Western media, I'm like, that's really bad, you know? But then when I look at my own, uh, my own city and I, I look at certain monuments coming down, I'm glad to see them come down as, you know, um, the descendant of enslaved Africans and exploited indigenous people. So I'm just, I'm just wondering kind of what your thoughts are in drawing those parallels. Well, I, th I think, um... The simpler answer would be uh, the emergence and the disappearance or the destruction of the objects 
are simply, you know, like they are signs of their timestamps, right? They, the culture that creates the object, uh, whether it be, you know, like uh, ancient Egypt or like this like early Republic monuments, um, they are, you know, like trying to convince themselves and they're trying to convince others that, you know, like this is the new order and this is gonna be eternal in some way and it's permanent. And we learn to see those objects as permanent, but they usually only uh, withstand and they only last as long as that culture prevails. And I think the destruction or the turning down of the monuments that is happening and has happened to the past, I think one year and a half and so on, um, is only a sign that those, like that order is being contested or maybe it's being brought down, hopefully, I don't know. Uh, but I think that's kind of like, it's, it's part of the metabolism of that materiality of the object. Um, to remind the culture that those objects are not permanent, that this, is the not, the, the, this isn't the only way that the order needs to be. This is the only thing that can be put in that place. Um, it is very common for, it was very common for you know, like Latin American countries that, uh, we would repurpose uh, statues and we would repurpose monuments because uh, we needed something there or because we were afraid that the, the object was going to be destroyed or whatever. So they, you know, like they, they are converted, they are transformed, that there wasn't enough money to finish the monument. So it was transformed, rebranded into something different. And uh, all of that is so contingent. And it is as well so contingent that the object is there. It's just a matter of politics and chance and so much. Um, so I think, um, I think what, what is happening, what it shows us is that the time or the political eras are kind of compressing in so many ways. Uh, social processes have been accelerated because capitalism is accelerating. So all of those metabolisms tend to happen in shorter spans. So reactions are quicker. Um, and I think that's what's happening with the objects. Like when we see the span of durability of like ancient objects versus what we try to build as a, you know, like contemporary culture. It's just like, there's like, uh, those limits are becoming shorter and shorter and something else will come up after that and it will be shorter and then, I don't know. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, yeah that like sh that like compression i guess of the the time spans or even like our um capacities to to understand the 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 structures of the history that we're like living in and the future we're like preparing um yeah like that's that's part of i think what i was also trying to get at is like that that brushing off of what we, what's so like in us. Um, and in some ways that like is being perpetrated by the, by like, like, like I was also, like, I guess one note I took here in thinking about this is like this, um, these transformations of how we understand these objects in the way that they're being shared to us in these institutional spaces is now like a fraction of what happens online um, and the ways in which um, cultural symbols are completely then uh, like remixed in this like horrific ways. Um, or heroic ways, or um, it's like ways that we could have never imagined, but that totally destroy that context. Um, but because of the the lack of materiality, it feels um, not as violent. But because of the distribution, it actually feels maybe more violent. Um, yeah, I'm just like kind of thinking about those aspects of what you're talking about and like practices that may have less of a, a reference point that's right into the spaces of these institutions, but that is um, 
maybe more in the cyberspace? Uh, I can think only of bad examples, right? Like that probe that was <laughs> kind of like appropriated by the alt-right uh, and it became like an alt-right symbol and so on. But I, I also can think of good examples. Uh, I think internet has also been super helpful to uh, disperse and disseminate the, you know, like re resistance usages of language. And I think, uh, for example, feminism is doing so well, like reframing and, and, and appropriating words. Um, and that this has happened for, you know, like the, since forever. Uh, but I think uh, the possibility of internet like becoming an educational tool, uh, a tool for creating social agreements so that language uh, can prevail and not be, you know, like just a, a localized movement, but rather become like something widely used. Uh, I think the internet is super useful for those, for those operations. Um, so yeah, I think I can think of good and bad examples, but, um, but uh, as Sharita was kind of like trying to point out at some point, at some point during uh, her last question, yeah, uh, it's not a disciplinary thing. This happens like every time it happens every day, the, the, the usages of language, the usages of social and cultural symbols, it's always kind of like turned down and like reframe and reused and so on. I, in your answer, it's, it's pulling me back to this. Um, I don't know why I was trying to pull together kind of a metaphor uh, between the, the Bennett quote and the worms and that archeologists owe a great, uh, you know, kind of a, they, they have a, a debt to worms in some way, they should be grateful to them. And, you know, the slides that you showed after that and talking about different people pulling in these artifacts from movies and kind of this visual culture production, I, for some reason, started to draw a parallel between the, the keepers of visual culture, you know, people, nor, regular people, if you will, as these kind of worms and keepers of these these stories and these like heroes and um, you know that are kind of told through Hollywood, and so I guess my the question I have now with with the internet and and kind of the amount of culture that's being produced there is, um, yeah, I don't know who do you, and, and who is who owes a great debt? Who should be grateful to whom when we think about the kind of um, larger cultural churning that we can kind of shake loose uh, and, and the, the kind of new narratives that we can tell through these museums? Like who, who should we be grateful to or who, yeah, I'm just kind of curious. And, and who are the new, uh, what is the new archeologists, you know, with all these kinds of things going on? This is, these, these are very nerdy, weird questions, sorry. <laughs> it's um, so I'll try to answer in, in a couple of ways. Uh, one of them being, I think, um, those years change depending who like who's controlling the narrative, right? Uh, so people like us might be thankful for like to some, but like, but others might be thankful to others because because we're trying to co control the narrative politically and, and acts will have different meaning for us. Uh, but I think uh, all of those disciplines are trying to reinvent themselves in so many ways. Like I, I read about uh, someone who is an archaeologist of video games maybe three or four days ago and spends their days like trying to recover the I guess bits and pieces of uh, a new phenomenon we have to deal with and I think uh, uh, practices like electronic literature have had to deal with for maybe 20 30 years already which is uh, the threat of obsolescence uh, so uh, we create like this huge digital realm, but that but has like this very short temporality, and then like everything disappears because we cannot simply uh, you know like try to uh, recover something that is in a disk that is media that is not available to us right now, right? So we have to create and recreate and, and create new ways and reproduce and copy and whatever. Uh, uh, a lot of culture that it's kind of like in the threat of being trapped uh, in this obsolete in this obsolete and aging formats at all times and in that process uh, you know like it's like when you go to like Rome and everybody touches the feet of some saint and eventually they lose their toe or whatever uh, I think that's kind of what happens with with you know like digital realms and, and will keep happening and in itself it's kind of a creative act and and we 
end up with some mashup of whatever it was at the beginning, right? There's um, a few questions um, in the Q and A, and one one that I want to start with is this idea of giving up on permanence and longevity, and in some ways, like that's an interesting tie-in with now the, the conversation around the digital too. But then also, and the question is, is um, the ability, like how can we carry uh, generational memory forward um, uh, in a way if we're if we are going to get, if if like permanence and longevity are called into question, like how do we keep moving that forward? Well, the first thing that I would say is that I don't think any like any remark uh, related to the preservation and the destruction of heritage might be absolute uh, in the sense that I think some and maybe most of the value. Uh, of a practice or an object or whatever can be uh, preserved. Um, and I think uh, and, uh, maybe as Joseph quickly was putting it, it's just like we're not losing information, but rather we're adding layers of information to the things that we already have. Uh, so what we're, it's like the Torah, right? Is it like the Torah or what is it? What is the, this Jewish book that you open and like the first layer is like the text itself and you have then interpretations and then interpretations after interpretations, right? Like that's what we got. So what we got is just like a broader specter of, uh, yeah, of understanding of what that object have meant for different cultures at different times. Um, and I think that history needs to be uh, kind of like embedded in some way in the object with the many technologies that we have, like maybe museum practices need to deal with that, maybe writing needs to deal with that, maybe digital um, formats and digital strategies for preservation need to think about those things as well. Um, that's why I kind of um, uh, chose to kind of appropriate the title of like Daniel Spoyer's book, which is basically that. It's just like something that you find by chance, but and then it becomes like this important object that is for revisited, revisited intensely until it becomes like something uh, important. Um, I don't think longevity will be an issue because we're just like um, creating like new bunkers for art and like bigger da data centers and we'll just obsess with that. So, so I, I think uh, the threat of the disappearance of uh, uh, preserving practices is the threat of disappearance of the world. I mean. As far as we can go. There's another question. I'll just read it as it is from the Q&A. What do you think of authenticity of artifacts that can be continually reproduced, preserved digitally? Does the digital footprint of an artifact expand its meaning or detract from it? Um, well, I don't know. Like, I think the market is trying to capitalize on that right now. Like, now they're trading art through blockchain, right? Uh, it's just like capitalism, like finding a way to to get a hold of whatever we were trying to do. I remember when when the internet, when we were you know like early users of the internet, the internet was like this place of hope, uh, where you could do anything, where you could be anyone or whatever. And like we cannot change our names right now on social media because like they also spend our accounts, right? Um, so I don't. I, I always think that any operation is an addition of meaning because we already know the other history in so many ways. Um, Could be that blockchain and NFTs are a good place to end actually. Um, it seems like a, a, an ending point for so many things. Um, yeah, and I think they already stole some artworks that were on NFT, so. <laughs> I mean, everybody gets like, they find a way to get into the market, like even thieves, right? Absolutely, yeah. Well, David, I just wanna thank you again and thank everybody for coming, um, for everybody's help, Jay on Terry for helping set all this up for PNCA Tech, um, really fantastic. Really enjoyed the talk and I'm looking forward to what's next for you and for actually being in the same room sometime.
Oh, absolutely. I really look forward to it. I still want to go. Uh, I hope we find the, the opportunity. And I'm still like looking forward to uh, keep doing programs with uh, artists from uh, from Oregon. I'm actually uh, gonna give still gonna give some studio visits this week and next week. So and we have a lot to talk about, and I look forward to all of that. And uh, next for me, uh, the exhibition that I was telling you about, never spoken again, is coming to Savannah, Georgia. And then I, I can't quite remember what's the next place, but it will keep touring until 2023. So I. I hope that you get to see it as well. Yeah, me too. Yeah, we'll, we'll make it happen. Awesome. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you for all, all of you for making this happen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. All right. Good, good night, everyone.